but Nash's greatest work is the bleakest of them all. It's the morning after the battle. The sun is rising. And now, the sunrise is typically a symbol of hope and rebirth and renewal. But not this sunrise, because this sunrise doesn't reveal a twinkling new morning. It reveals a truly appalling scene. You can see here a sky that's blood red, filled with all the blood that has been shed the night before. You can see a forest all the way here of burnt and broken trees. And underneath this crazy, writhing ocean of mud. And out of that mud, these trees become metaphors for the dead buried beneath them, with their sagging limbs like the arms. These become like the bodies who have fallen on the field of battle. Parts of this tree here look like a, like a hand imploring the heavens, but the heavens remain indifferent. I mean, I think this is a, a truly brutal, an incredibly powerful attack on war and its consequences from Nash. And I think it's more powerful than any book or any poem or any film, precisely because it's so silent and so empty and so wordless. But as war turned to peace, it wasn't horror that people wanted. They wanted hope. And one artist was determined to provide it. Stanley Spencer had given four years of his life to the war. First as a medical orderly, and then as a frontline soldier in Macedonia. And it was in a quiet corner of Hampshire that he set about creating a masterpiece that would finally consign the war to history. This is the Sandham Memorial Chapel. Few come here today, but I believe this modest brick building contains one of our most neglected treasures. And an artwork that completes the great reawakening of British painting. In the mornings when I open up, I, I say good morning chapel and tell it how well it's looking. As custodian, you get to do everything. So the gardens and the chapel and the buildings and the day-to-day -day cleaning and maintenance, things like that. You stand in the middle of the chapel and you look around and that's the closest you'll ever get to being inside Spencer's mind. Just having all these images around you. In his chapel, Spencer created an artwork on a scale of the great fresco cycles of the Italian Renaissance. But he did it in his own inimitable way. This is Spencer's war. And Spencer's war began as an orderly in a Bristol hospital. This is the first thing you see as you come in here. And it shows the wounded returning from the Western Front and arriving at the war hospital in Bristol and the big iron gates are being opened for them. Now, you would think this scene would be a scene of horror and pain and suffering, but not for Stanley. You see the soldiers, although they've got their slings and their bandages and their casts, 
they almost seem to be having a good time at the top of this open top bus and there are these beautiful rhododendron flowers around them. So the whole scene seems like some kind of bank holiday outing rather than some terrible traumatic scene of the First World War. And this is the case of all of these pictures in here. This is probably my favourite, and it shows the beds being made in the hospital. Now, the best thing about it is this figure on the left, because he's so cold as his bed's being made that he's wrapped himself completely in his blankets, and he's keeping his feet warm by standing on a hot water bottle. Now, I remember doing that as a child when it was particularly cold in the morning, and it's just amazing that a scene like this could ever make its way into a war painting. But that's the great thing about Spencer, you know, he's not painting the horror of war, he's not painting the brutality of war, he's painting, if anything, the banality of war. And you can see the banality in this picture. This shows tea in the ward, and you can see these enormous piles, like Jenga, of bread and butter. And Spencer's favourite meal in the world was bread and butter. This is called ablutions and it shows the early morning washing up and cleaning. So you can see one guy polishing the taps like he's sort of doing a rock and roll dance with the taps. You can see another person having their back scrubbed. And this person in the foreground is washing their hair in a, in a sink. Now, Spencer actually had an enormous amount of difficulty painting the soap suds on the hair, so he did it himself and sketched himself in the mirror as he washed his hair. Everywhere you find these domestic moments But his most memorable images were drawn from his experiences of the front line in Macedonia. The culmination of the whole project is this painting, 21 feet high. It took Spencer almost a year to paint, and it shows a battlefield, an enormous battlefield in Macedonia that's filled with all the soldiers that have died during the war. Spencer's friends, Spencer's comrades. But here, they're all being resurrected. They're all climbing out of the earth, rubbing their eyes, looking around, and saying hello to their old friends, the friends they thought they'd never see again. Towards the end of his life, Spencer returned to revisit this work that meant so much to him. When I did this resurrection altarpiece, I wanted it to be in a particular place that I remembered and uh, I felt that all that I hoped for, of all the coming back home and everything, could be celebrated there. These places from which the men were rising from, as you see down below, just by the altar, are they rising in a place which, in a sense, they would like to rise in. It's a, it's a happy place. And that I was very keen about that one makes this battlefield a happy place without altering anything. I tried to get this feeling of, of the consciousness of the cross getting more and more tense as it gets up. And when it gets to the man above those mules who's reclining over a crucifix, and I get a feeling he's there forever. I don't think anything, any bomb or anything dropping behind his head will make him take the least notice. Immediately above him, you see Christ as just a man among the men receiving the crosses and quietly talking to them. Well, I feel in that way that all these things which were previously war scenes now having to behave as the bringers of the happy message of the resurrection.
Every single wound of war is being healed in this picture, in this whole chapel. You can see here, they're shaking hands. I've got to say that I think that's one of the, the greatest passages of 20th century painting, that handshake. Because, you know, a handshake is something we do every day. But Spencer found something epic in it, something momentous in it. And you realise that that handshake isn't just a handshake between old friends who thought they'd never see each other again. It's a handshake between the past and the future. With the Sander Memorial Chapel, Stanley Spencer had reinvented tradition to create a timeless sanctuary amid the chaos of the modern world. But Spencer had not been alone in responding to the challenges of his age. The 10 years or so between 1910 and 1919 must surely rank as the most remarkable in the whole history of British art. Because in those years, British artists turned themselves into nothing less than the conscience of the entire nation. They showed us the problems and possibilities of the modern world. They told us the truth about the First World War when hardly anyone else would. And with the nation in trauma, they gave us hope and strength for the future. In the next episode, British painters lead the country through a period of national crisis. Some find refuge in nostalgia, some in fantasy, while others search for the timeless spirit of the English countryside. But in the darkest hour, they come together to create an image of Britain in which we can believe and for which we can fight. <laughs>